Section 20 of the Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin D. Roosevelt. Section 20. February 23, 1942. Part 1. My Fellow Americans, Washington's birthday is a most appropriate occasion for us to talk with each other about other things as they are today, and things as we know they shall be in the future. For eight years, General Washington and his Continental Army were faced continually with formidable odds and reoccurring defeats. Supplies and equipment were lacking. In a sense, every winter was a valley forge. Throughout the thirteen states there existed fifth columnists, and selfish men, jealous men, fearful men, who proclaimed that Washington's cause was hopeless, and that he should ask for a negotiated peace. Washington's conduct in those hard times has provided the model for all Americans ever since, a model of moral stamina. He held to his course, as it had been charted in the Declaration of Independence, he and the brave men who served with him knew that no man's life or fortune was secure without freedom and free institutions. The present great struggle has taught us increasingly that freedom of persons and security of property everywhere in the world depend upon the security of the rights and obligations of liberty and justice everywhere in the world. This war is a new kind of war. It is different from all other wars of the past, not only in its methods and weapons, but also in its geography. It is a warfare in terms of every continent, every island, every sea, every air lane in the world. That is the reason why I have asked you to take out and spread before you a map of the whole earth, and to follow with me the references which I shall make to the world-encircling battle lines of this war. Many questions will, I fear, remain unanswered tonight, but I know you will realize that I cannot cover everything in one short report to the people. The broad oceans, which have been heralded in the past as our protection from attack, have become endless battlefields on which we are constantly being challenged by our enemies. We must all understand and face the hard fact that our job now is to fight at distances which extend all the way around the globe. We fight at these vast distances because that is where our enemies are. Until our flow of supplies gives us clear superiority, we must keep on striking our enemies wherever and whenever we can meet them, even if for a while we have to yield ground. Actually, though, we are taking a heavy toll of the enemy every day that goes by. We must fight at these vast distances to protect our supply lines and our lines of communication with our allies, protect these lines from the enemies who are bending every ounce of their strength, striving against time to cut them. The object of the Nazis and the Japanese is to separate the United States, Britain, China, and Russia, and to isolate them one from another, so that each will be surrounded and cut off from sources of supplies and reinforcements. It is the old familiar Axis policy of divide and conquer. There are those who still think, however, in terms of the days of sailing ships. They advise us to pull our warships and our planes and our merchant ships into our own home waters, and concentrate solely on last-ditch defense. But let me illustrate what would happen if we followed such foolish advice. Look at your map. Look at the vast area of China, with its millions of fighting men. Look at the vast area of Russia, with its powerful armies and proven military might. Look at the British Isles, Australia, New Zealand, and the Dutch Indies, India, the Near East, and the continent of Africa with their resources of raw materials and of peoples determined to resist Axis domination. Look, too, at North America, Central America, and South America. 
it is obvious what would happen if all these great reservoirs of power were cut off from each other either by enemy action or by self-imposed isolation first in such a case we could no longer send aid of any kind to china to the brave people who for nearly five years have withstood japanese assault destroyed hundreds of thousands of japanese soldiers and vast quantities of japanese war munitions it is essential that we help china in her magnificent defense and in her inevitable counter-offensive for that is one important element in the defeat of japan second if we lost communication with the south pacific all of that area including australia and new zealand and the dutch indies would fall under japanese domination japan in such a case could release great numbers of ships and men to launch attacks on a large scale against the coasts of western hemisphere south america and central america and north america including alaska at the same time she could immediately extend her conquests in the other direction toward india and through the indian ocean to africa to the near east and try to join forces with germany and italy third if we were to stop sending munitions to the british and the russians in the mediterranean in the persian gulf and the red sea we would be helping the nazis to overrun turkey syria iraq persia egypt and the suez canal the whole coast of north africa itself and with that inevitably the whole coast of west africa put in germany within easy striking distance of south america fifteen hundred miles away fourth if by such a fatuous policy we cease to protect the north atlantic supply line to britain and to russia we would help to cripple the splendid counteroffensive by russia against the nazis and we would help to deprive britain of essential food supplies and munitions those americans who believed that we could live under the illusion of isolationism wanted the american eagle to imitate the tactics of the ostrich now many of those same people afraid that we may be sticking our necks out want our national bird to be turned into a turtle but we prefer to retain the eagle as it is flying high and striking hard i know that i speak for the mass of the american people when i say that we reject the turtle policy and will continue increasingly the policy of carrying the war to the enemy in distant lands and distant waters as far away as possible from our own home grounds there are four main lines of communication now being traveled by our ships the north atlantic the south atlantic the indian ocean and the south pacific these routes are not one-way streets for the ships that carry our troops and munitions outbound bring back essential raw materials which we require for our own use the maintenance of these vital lines is a very tough job it is a job which requires tremendous daring tremendous resourcefulness and above all tremendous production of planes and tanks and guns and also of ships to carry them and i speak again for the american people when i say that we can and will do that job the defense of the worldwide lines of communication demands relatively safe use by us of the sea and of the air along the various routes and this in turn depends upon control by the united nations of many strategic bases along those routes control of the air involves the simultaneous use of two types of planes first the long-range heavy bomber and second the light bombers dive bombers torpedo planes and short-range pursuit planes all of which are essential to the protection of the bases and of the bombers themselves heavy bombers can fly under their own power from here to the southwest pacific but the smaller planes cannot therefore these lighter planes have to be packed in crates and sent on board cargo ships look at your map again and you will see that the route is long and in many places perilous either across the south atlantic 
all the way around South Africa and the Cape of Good Hope, or from California to the East Indies direct. A vessel can make a round trip by either route in about four months, or only three round trips in a whole year. In spite of the length, and in spite of the difficulties of this transportation, I can tell you that in two and a half months we already have a large number of bombers and pursuit planes manned by American pilots and crews, which are now in daily contact with the enemy in the southwest Pacific, and thousands of American troops are today in that area engaged in operations not only in the air, but on the ground as well. In this battle area, Japan has had an obvious initial advantage, for she could fly even her short-range planes to the points of attack by using many stepping stones open to her, bases in the multitude of Pacific islands, and also bases on the China coast, Indo-China coast, and in Thailand, and Malay coast. Japanese troop transports could go south from Japan and from China through the narrow China Sea, which can be protected by Japanese planes throughout its whole length. I ask you to look at your maps again, particularly in that portion of the Pacific Ocean lying west of Hawaii. Before this war even started, the Philippine Islands were already surrounded on three sides by Japanese power. On the west, the China side, the Japanese were in possession of the coast of China and the coast of Indochina, which had been yielded to them by the Vichy French. On the north are the islands of Japan themselves, reaching down almost to northern Luzon. On the east are the mandated islands, which Japan had occupied exclusively and had fortified in absolute violation of her written word. The islands that lie between Hawaii and the Philippines, these islands, hundreds of them, appear only as small dots on most maps, but they cover a large strategic area. Guam lies in the middle of them, a lone outpost which we have never fortified. Under the Washington Treaty of 1921, we had solemnly agreed not to add to the fortification of the Philippines. We had no safe naval bases there so we could not use the islands for extensive naval operations. Immediately after this war started, the Japanese forces moved down on either side of the Philippines to numerous points south of them, thereby completely encircling the Philippines from north, south, east, and west. It is that complete encirclement with control of the air by Japanese land-based aircraft which has prevented us from sending substantial reinforcements of men and material to the gallant defenders of the philippines for forty years it has always been our strategy a strategy born of necessity that in the event of a full-scale attack on the islands by japan we should fight a delaying action attempting to retire slowly into Bataan peninsula and corregidor we knew that the war as a whole would have to be fought and won by a process of attrition against Japan itself. We knew all along that, with our great resources, we could ultimately outbuild Japan and ultimately overwhelm her on sea and on land and in the air. We knew that, to obtain our objective, many varieties of operations would be necessary in other areas other than the Philippines. Now... Nothing that has occurred in the past two months has caused us to revise this basic strategy of necessity, except that the defense put up by General MacArthur has magnificently exceeded the previous estimates of endurance, and he and his men are gaining eternal glory therefore. MacArthur's army of Filipinos and Americans and the forces of the United Nations in China in Burma and the Netherlands, East Indies, are all together fulfilling the same essential task. They are making Japan pay an increasingly terrible price for her ambitious attempts to seize control of the whole Asiatic world. Every Japanese transport sunk off Java is one less transport 
that they can use to carry reinforcements to their army opposing General MacArthur in Luzon. End of section 20. Section 21 of The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin D. Roosevelt. Section 21. February 23, 1942. Part 2. It has been said that Japanese gains in the Philippines were made possible only by the success of their surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. I tell you that this is not so. Even if the attack had not been made, your map will show that it would have been a hopeless operation for us to send the fleet to the Philippines through thousands of miles of ocean while all those island bases were under the sole control of the Japanese. The consequences of the attack on Pearl Harbor, serious as they were, have been wildly exaggerated in other ways, and these exaggerations come originally from Axis propagandists. But they have been repeated, I regret to say, by Americans in and out of public life. You and I have the utmost contempt for Americans, who since Pearl Harbor have whispered or announced off the record that there was no longer any Pacific fleet, that the fleet was all sunk or destroyed on December 7th, that more than a thousand of our planes were destroyed on the ground. They have suggested slyly that the government has withheld the truth about casualties, that eleven or twelve thousand men were killed at Pearl Harbor instead of the figures as officially announced. They have even served the enemy propagandists by spreading the incredible story that shiploads of bodies of our honored American dead were about to arrive in New York Harbor to be put into a common grave. Almost every Axis broadcast, Berlin, Rome, Tokyo, directly quotes Americans who, by speech or in the press, make damnable misstatements such as these. The American people realize that in many cases Details of military operations cannot be disclosed until we are absolutely certain that the announcement will not give to the enemy military information which he does not already possess. Your government has unmistakable confidence in your ability to hear the worst without flinching or losing heart. You must in turn have complete confidence that your government is keeping nothing from you except information that will help the enemy in his attempt to destroy us. In a democracy there is always a solemn pact of truth between government and the people, but there must also always be a full use of discretion, and that word discretion applies to the critics of government as well. This is war. The American people want to know, and will be told, the general trend of how the war is going. But they do not wish to help the enemy any more than our fighting forces do, and they will pay little attention to the rumor mongers and the poison peddlers in our midst. To pass from the realm of rumor and poison to the field of facts, the number of our officers and men killed in the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th was 2,340, and the number of wounded was 940. Of all of the combatant ships based on Pearl Harbor, battleships, heavy cruisers, light cruisers, aircraft carriers, destroyers, and submarines, only three are permanently put out of commission. Very many of the ships of the Pacific Fleet were not even in Pearl Harbor. Some of those that were there were hit very slightly, and others that were damaged have either rejoined the fleet by now or are still undergoing repairs. And when these repairs are completed, the ships will be more efficient fighting machines than they were before. The report that we lost more than a thousand planes at Pearl Harbor is as baseless as the other weird rumors. The Japanese do not know just how many planes they destroyed that day, and I am not going to tell them. But I can say that to date, including Pearl Harbor, 
we have destroyed considerably more Japanese planes than they have destroyed of ours. We have certainly suffered losses from Hitler's U-boats in the Atlantic as well as from the Japanese in the Pacific, and we shall suffer more of them before the turn of the tide. But speaking for the United States of America, let me say once and for all to the people of the world, we Americans have been compelled to yield ground, but we will regain it. We and the other United Nations are committed to the destruction of the militarism of Japan and Germany. We are daily increasing our strength. Soon we, and not our enemies, will have the offensive. We, not they, will win the final battles, and we, not they, will make the final peace. Conquered nations in Europe know what the yoke of the Nazis is like, and the people of Korea and Manchuria know in their flesh the harsh despotism of Japan. All of the people of Asia know that if there is to be an honorable and decent future for any of them or any of us, that future depends on victory by the United Nations over the forces of Axis enslavement. If a just and durable peace is to be attained, or even if all of us are merely to save our own skins, there is one thought for us here at home to keep uppermost, the fulfillment of our special task of production. Germany and Italy and Japan are very close to their maximum output of planes, guns, tanks, and ships. The United Nations are not, especially the United States of America. Our first job, then, is to build up production, uninterrupted production, so that the United Nations can maintain control of the seas and attain control of the air, not merely a slight superiority, but an overwhelming superiority. On January 6th of this year, I set certain definite goals of production for airplanes, tanks, guns, and ships. The Axis propagandists called them fantastic. Tonight, and nearly two months later, and after a careful survey of progress by Donald Nelson and others charged with responsibility for our production, I can tell you that those goals will be attained. In every part of the country, experts in production and the men and women at work in the plants are giving loyal service. With few exceptions, labor, capital, and farming realize that this is no time either to make undue profits or to gain special advantages one over the other. We are calling for new plants and additions, additions to old plants. We are calling for plant conversion to war needs. We are seeking more men and more women to run them. We are working longer hours. We are coming to realize that one extra plane or extra tank or extra gun or extra ship completed tomorrow may in a few months turn the tide on some distant battlefield it may make the difference between life and death for some of our fighting men we know now that if we lose this war it will be generations or even centuries before our conception of democracy can live again and we can lose this war only if we slow up our effort or if we waste our ammunition sniping at each other here are three high purposes for every american number one we shall not stop work for a single day if any dispute arises we shall keep on working while the dispute is solved by mediation or conciliation or arbitration until the war is won two we shall not demand special gains or special privileges or special advantages for any one group or occupation. 3. We shall give up conveniences and modify the routine of our lives if our country asks us to do so. We will do it cheerfully, remembering that the common enemy seeks to destroy every home and every freedom in every part of our land. This generation of Americans has come to realize, with a present and personal realization, that there is something larger and more important than the life of any individual or of any individual group, something for which a man will sacrifice, and gladly sacrifice, not only his pleasures, not only his goods, not only his associations with those he loves, but his life itself. 
in time of crisis when the future is in the balance we come to understand with full recognition and devotion what this nation is and what we owe to it the axis propagandists have tried in various evil ways to destroy our determination and our morale failing in that they are now trying to destroy our confidence in our own allies they say that the british are finished that the russians and the chinese are about to quit patriotic and sensible americans will reject these absurdities and instead of listening to any of this crude propaganda they will recall some of the things that nazis and japanese have said and are still saying about us ever since this nation became the arsenal of democracy ever since enactment of lend-lease there has been one persistent theme through all axis propaganda this theme has been that americans are admittedly rich that americans have considerable industrial power but that americans are soft and decadent that they cannot and will not unite and work and fight from berlin rome and tokyo we have been described as a nation of weaklings playboys who would hire british soldiers or russian soldiers or chinese soldiers to do our fighting for us let them repeat that now let them tell that to general macarthur and his men let them tell that to the sailors who today are hitting hard in the far waters of the pacific let them tell that to the boys in the flying fortresses let them tell that to the marines the united nations constitute an association of independent peoples of equal dignity and equal importance the united nations are dedicated to a common cause we share equally and with equal zeal the anguish and the awful sacrifices of war in the partnership of our common enterprise we must share in a unified plan in which all of us must play our several parts each of us being equally indispensable and dependent one on the other we have unified command and cooperation and comradeship we americans will contribute unified production and unified acceptance of sacrifice and of effort that means a national unity that can know no limitations of race or creed or selfish politics the american people will expect that much from themselves and the american people will find ways and means of expressing their determination to their enemies including the japanese admiral who has said that he will dictate the terms of peace here in the white house we of the united nations are agreed on certain broad principles in the kind of peace we seek the atlantic charter applies not only to the parts of the world that border the atlantic but to the whole world disarmament of aggressors self-determination of nations and peoples and the four freedoms freedom of speech freedom of religion freedom from want and freedom from fear the british and the russian people have known the full fury of nazi onslaught there have been times when the fate of london and moscow was in serious doubt but there was never the slightest question that either the british or the russians would yield and today all the united nations salute the superb russian army as it celebrates the twenty-fourth anniversary of its first assembly though their homeland was overrun the dutch people are still fighting stubbornly and powerfully overseas the great chinese people have suffered grievous losses chung king has been almost wiped out of existence yet it remains the capital of an unbeatable china that is the conquering spirit which prevails throughout the united nations in this war the task that we americans now face will test us to the uttermost never before have we been called upon for such a prodigious effort never before have we had so little time in which to do so much these are the times that try men's souls tom paine wrote those words on a drumhead by the light of a campfire that was when washington's little army of ragged rugged men was retreating across new jersey having tasted nothing but defeat 
and General Washington ordered that these great words written by Tom Paine be read to the men of every regiment in the Continental Army. And this was the assurance given to the first American armed forces. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the sacrifice, the more glorious the triumph. So spoke Americans in the year 1776. So speak Americans today. End of section 21. Section 22 of The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin D. Roosevelt. April 28, 1942. Part 1 my fellow americans it is nearly five months since we were attacked at pearl harbor for the two years prior to that attack this country had been gearing itself up to a high level of production of munitions and yet our war efforts had done little to dislocate the normal lives of most of us since then we have dispatched strong forces of our army and navy several hundred thousand of them to bases and battlefronts thousands of miles from home we have stepped up our war production on a scale that is testing our industrial power our engineering genius and our economic structure to the utmost we have had no illusions about the fact that this is a tough job and a long one american warships are now in combat in the north and south atlantic in the arctic in the mediterranean in the indian ocean and in the north and south pacific american troops have taken stations in south america greenland iceland the british isles the near east the middle east and the far east the continent of australia and many islands of the pacific american warplanes manned by americans are flying in actual combat over all the continents and all the oceans on the european front the most important development of the past year has been without question the crushing counteroffensive on the part of the great armies of russia against the powerful german army these russian forces have destroyed and are destroying more armed power of our enemies troops planes tanks and guns than all the other united nations put together in the mediterranean sea matters remain on the surface much as they were but the situation there is receiving very careful attention recently we received news of a change in government in what we used to know as the republic of france a name dear to the hearts of all lovers of liberty a name and an institution which we hope will soon be restored to full dignity throughout the nazi occupation of france we have hoped for the maintenance of a french government which would strive to regain independence to re-establish the principles of liberty equality and fraternity and to restore the historic culture of france our policy has been consistent from the very beginning however we are now greatly concerned lest those who have recently come to power may seek to force the brave french people into submission to nazi despotism the united nations will take measures if necessary to prevent the use of french territory in any part of the world for military purposes by the axis powers the good people of france will readily understand that such action is essential for the united nations to prevent assistance to the armies or navies or air forces of germany or italy or japan the overwhelming majority of the french people understand that the fight of the united nations is fundamentally their fight that our victory means the restoration of a free and independent france and the saving of france from the slavery which would be imposed upon her by her external enemies and by her internal traitors we know how the french people really feel we know that a deep-seated determination to obstruct every step in the axis plan extends from occupied france through vichy france 
all the way to the people of their colonies in every ocean and on every continent our planes are helping in the defense of french colonies today and soon american flying fortresses will be fighting for the liberation of the darkened continent of europe itself in all the occupied countries there are men and women and even little children who have never stopped fighting never stopped resisting never stopped proving to the nazis that their so-called new order will never be enforced upon free peoples in the german and italian peoples themselves there is a growing conviction that the cause of nazism and fascism is hopeless that their political and military leaders have led them along the bitter road which leads not to world conquest but to final defeat they cannot fail to contrast the present frantic speeches of these leaders with their arrogant boastings of a year ago and two years ago on the other side of the world in the far east we have passed through a phase of serious losses we have inevitably lost control of a large portion of the philippine islands but this whole nation pays tribute to the filipino and american officers and men who held out so long on batan peninsula to those grim and gallant fighters who still hold corregidor where the flag flies and to the forces that are still striking effectively at the enemy on mindanao and other islands the malayan peninsula and singapore are in the hands of the enemy the netherlands east indies are almost entirely occupied though resistance there continues many other islands are in the possession of the japanese but there is good reason to believe that their southward advance has been checked australia new zealand and much other territory will be basis for offensive action and we are determined that the territory that has been lost will be regained the japanese are pressing their northward advance against burma with considerable power driving toward india and china they have been opposed with great bravery by small british and chinese forces aided by american flyers the news in burma tonight is not good the japanese may cut the burma road but i want to say to the gallant people of china that no matter what advances the japanese may make ways will be found to deliver airplanes and munitions of war to the armies of generalissimo shang kai shek we remember that the chinese people were the first to stand up and fight against the aggressors in this war and in the future a still unconquerable china will play its proper role in maintaining peace and prosperity not only in eastern asia but in the whole world for every advance that the japanese have made since they started their frenzied career of conquest they have had to pay a very heavy toll in warships in transports in planes and in men they are feeling the effects of those losses it is even reported from japan that somebody has dropped bombs on tokyo and on other principal centers of japanese war industries if this be true it is the first time in history that japan has suffered such indignities although the treacherous attack on pearl harbor was the immediate cause of our entry into the war that event found the american people spiritually prepared for war on a world-wide scale we went into this war fighting we know what we are fighting for we realize that the war has become what hitler originally proclaimed it to be a total war not all of us can have the privilege of fighting our enemies in distant parts of the world not all of us can have the privilege of working in a munitions factory or a shipyard or on the farms or in oil fields or mines producing the weapons or the raw materials that are needed by our armed forces but there is one front and one battle where everyone in the united states every man woman and child is in action and will be privileged to remain in action throughout this war that front is right here at home in our daily lives and in our daily tasks here at home everyone will have the privilege of making whatever self-denial is necessary not only to supply our fighting men but to keep the economic structure of our country fortified and secure during the war and after the war this will require of course the abandonment not only of luxuries but of many other creature comforts every loyal american is aware of his individual responsibility whenever i hear anyone saying the american people are complacent they need to be aroused i feel like asking him to come to washington to read the mail that floods into the white house and into all departments of this government the one question that recurs through all these thousands of letters and messages is 
what more can i do to help my country in winning this war to build the factories to buy the materials to pay the labor to provide the transportation to equip and feed and house the soldiers sailors and marines and to do all the thousands of things necessary in a war all cost a lot of money more money than has ever been spent by any nation at any time in the long history of the world we are now spending solely for war purposes the sum of about one hundred million dollars every day in the week but before this year is over that almost unbelievable rate of expenditure will be doubled all of this money has to be spent and spent quickly if we are to produce within the time now available the enormous quantities of weapons of war which we need but the spending of these tremendous sums presents grave danger of disaster to our national economy when your government continues to spend these unprecedented sums for munitions month by month and year by year that money goes into the pocketbooks and bank accounts of the people of the united states at the same time raw materials and many manufactured goods are necessarily taken away from civilian use and machinery and factories are being converted to war production you do not have to be a professor of mathematics or economics to see that if people with plenty of cash start bidding against each other for scarce goods the price of those goods goes up yesterday i submitted to the congress of the united states a seven-point program of general principles which taken together could be called the national economic policy for attaining the great objective of keeping the cost of living down i repeat them now to you in substance first we must through heavier taxes keep personal and corporate profits at a low reasonable rate second we must fix ceilings on prices and rents third we must stabilize wages fourth we must stabilize farm prices fifth we must put more billions into war bonds sixth we must ration all essential commodities which are scarce seventh we must discourage installment buying and encourage paying off debts and mortgages i do not think it is necessary to repeat what i said yesterday to the congress in discussing these general principles the important thing to remember is that each one of these points is dependent on the others if the whole program is to work some people are already taking the position that every one of the seven points is correct except the one point which steps on their own individual toes a few seem very willing to approve self-denial on the part of their neighbors the only effective course of action is a simultaneous attack on all of the factors which increase the cost of living in one comprehensive all-embracing program covering prices and profits and wages and taxes and debts the blunt fact is that every single person in the united states is going to be affected by this program some of you will be affected more directly by one or two of these restrictive measures but all of you will be affected indirectly by all of them end of section twenty two section twenty three of the fireside chats of franklin delano roosevelt this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b the fireside chats of franklin delano roosevelt by franklin d roosevelt april twenty eighth nineteen forty two part two are you a business man or do you own stock in a business corporation well your profits are going to be cut down to a reasonably low level by taxation your income will be subject to higher taxes indeed in these days when every available dollar should go to the war effort i do not think that any american citizen should have a net income in excess of twenty five thousand dollars per year after payment of taxes are you a retailer or a wholesaler or a manufacturer or a farmer or a landlord ceilings are being placed on the prices at which you can sell your goods or rent your property do you work for wages you will have to forego higher wages for your particular job for the duration of the war all of us are used to spending money for things that we want things however which are not absolutely essential we will all have to forego that kind of spending 
because we must put every dime and every dollar we can possibly spare out of our earnings into war bonds and stamps because the demands of the war effort require the rationing of goods of which there is not enough to go around because the stopping of purchases of non-essentials will release thousands of workers who are needed in the war effort as i told the congress yesterday sacrifice is not exactly the proper word with which to describe this program of self-denial when at the end of this great struggle we shall have saved our free way of life we shall have made no sacrifice the price for civilization must be paid in hard work and sorrow and blood the price is not too high if you doubt it ask those millions who live today under the tyranny of hitlerism ask the workers of france and norway and the netherlands whipped to labor by the lash whether the stabilization of wages is too great a sacrifice ask the farmers of poland and denmark of czechoslovakia and france looted of their livestock starving while their own crops are stolen from their land ask them whether parity prices are too great a sacrifice ask the business men of europe whose enterprises have been stolen from their owners whether the limitation of profits and personal incomes is too great a sacrifice ask the women and children whom hitler is starving whether the rationing of tires and gasoline and sugar is too great a sacrifice we do not have to ask them they have already given us their agonized answers this great war effort must be carried through to its victorious conclusion by the indomitable will and determination of the people as one great whole it must not be impeded by the faint of heart it must not be impeded by those who put their own selfish interests above the interests of the nation it must not be impeded by those who pervert honest criticism into falsification of fact it must not be impeded by self-styled experts either in economics or military problems who know neither true figures nor geography itself it must not be impeded by a few bogus patriots who use the sacred freedom of the press to echo the sentiments of the propagandists in tokyo and berlin and above all it shall not be imperiled by the handful of noisy traitors betrayers of america betrayers of christianity itself would-be dictators who in their hearts and souls have yielded to hitlerism and would have this republic do likewise i shall use all of the executive power that i have to carry out the policy laid down if it becomes necessary to ask for any additional legislation in order to attain our objective of preventing a spiral in the cost of living i shall do so i know the american farmer the american workman and the american business man i know that they will gladly embrace this economy and equality of sacrifice satisfied that it is necessary for the most vital and compelling motive in all their lives winning through to victory never in the memory of man has there been a war in which the courage the endurance and the loyalty of civilians played so vital a part many thousands of civilians all over the world have been and are being killed or maimed by enemy action indeed it was the fortitude of the common people of britain under fire which enabled that island to stand and prevented hitler from winning the war in nineteen forty the ruins of london and coventry and other cities are today the proudest monuments to british heroism our own american civilian population is now relatively safe from such disasters and to an ever-increasing extent our soldiers sailors and marines are fighting with great bravery and skill on far distant fronts to make sure that we shall remain safe i should like to tell you one or two stories about the men we have in our armed forces there is for example dr corydon m wassell he was a missionary well known for his good works in china he is a simple modest retiring man nearly sixty years old but he entered the service of his country and was commissioned a lieutenant commander in the navy dr wassell was assigned to duty in java caring for wounded officers and men of the cruisers houston and marblehead which had been in heavy action in the java seas when the japanese advanced across the island it was decided to evacuate as many as possible of the wounded to australia but about twelve of the men were so badly wounded that they could not be moved dr wassell remained with these men knowing that he would be captured by the enemy 
but he decided to make a last desperate attempt to get the men out of java he asked each of them if he wished to take the chance and every one agreed he first had to get the twelve men to the seacoast fifty miles away to do this he had to improvise stretchers for the hazardous journey the men were suffering severely but dr wassell kept them alive by his skill and inspired them by his own courage and as the official report said dr wassell was almost like a christ-like shepherd devoted to his flock on the seacoast he embarked the men on a little dutch ship they were bombed they were machine-gunned by waves of japanese planes dr wassell took virtual command of the ship and by great skill avoided destruction hiding in little bays and little inlets a few days later dr wassell and his small flock of wounded men reached australia safely and to-day dr wassell wears the navy cross another story concerns a ship a ship rather than an individual man you may remember the tragic sinking of the submarine the u s s squalus off the new england coast in the summer of nineteen thirty nine some of the crew were lost but others were saved by the speed and the efficiency of the surface rescue crews the squalus itself was tediously raised from the bottom of the sea she was repaired and put back into commission and eventually she sailed again under a new name the u s s sailfish Today she is a potent and effective unit of our submarine fleet in the southwest pacific the sailfish has covered many thousands of miles in operations in those waters she has sunk a japanese destroyer she has torpedoed a japanese cruiser she has made torpedo hits two of them on a japanese aircraft carrier three of the enlisted men of our navy who went down with the squalus in nineteen thirty nine and were rescued are today serving on the same ship the u s s sailfish in this war it seems to me that it is heartening to know that the squalus once given up as lost rose from the depths to fight for our country in time of peril one more story that i heard only this morning this is a story of one of our army flying fortresses operating in the western pacific the pilot of this plane is a modest young man proud of his crew for one of the toughest fights a bomber has yet experienced the bomber departed from its base as part of a flight of five bombers to attack japanese transports that were landing troops against us in the philippines when they had gone about halfway to their destination one of the motors of this bomber went out of commission the young pilot lost contact with the other bombers the crew however got the motor working got it going again and the plane proceeded on its mission alone by the time it arrived at its target the other four flying fortresses had already passed over had dropped their bombs and had stirred up the hornet's nest of japanese zero planes eighteen of these zero fighters attacked our one flying fortress despite this mass attack our plane proceeded on its mission and dropped all of its bombs on six japanese transports which were lined up along the docks as it turned back on its homeward journey a running fight between the bomber and the eighteen japanese pursuit planes continued for seventy-five miles four pursuit planes of the japs attacked simultaneously at each side four were shot down with the side guns during this fight the bomber's radio operator was killed the engineer's right hand was shot off and one gunner was crippled leaving only one man available to operate both side guns although wounded in one hand this gunner alternately manned both side guns bringing down three more japanese zero planes while this was going on one engine on the american bomber was shot out one gas tank was hit the radio was shot off and the oxygen system was entirely destroyed out of eleven control cables all but four were shot away the rear landing wheel was blown off entirely and the two front wheels were both shot flat the fight continued until the remaining japanese pursuit ships exhausted their ammunition and turned back with two engines gone and the plane practically out of control the american bomber returned to its base after dark and made an emergency landing the mission had been accomplished the name of that pilot is captain hewitt t willis of the united states army he comes from a place called menard texas with a population two thousand three hundred seventy five he has been awarded the distinguished service cross and i hope that he is listening 
these stories i have told you are not exceptional they are typical examples of individual heroism and skill as we here at home contemplate our own duties our own responsibilities let us think and think hard of the example which is being set for us by our fighting men our soldiers and sailors are members of well-disciplined units but they are still and forever individuals free individuals they are farmers and workers business men professional men artists clerks they are the united states of america that is why they fight we too are the united states of america that is why we must work and sacrifice it is for them it is for us it is for victory end of section twenty three Section 24 of the Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin D. Roosevelt. September 7, 1942 my friends i wish that all the american people could read all the citations for various medals recommended for our soldiers and sailors and marines i am picking out one of these citations which tells of the accomplishments of lieutenant john james powers united states navy during three days of the battles with japanese forces in the coral sea during the first two days lieutenant powers flying a dive bomber in the face of blasting enemy anti-aircraft fire, demolished one large enemy gunboat, put another gunboat out of commission, severely damaged an aircraft tender and a 20,000-ton transport, and scored a direct hit on an aircraft carrier, which burst into flames and sank soon after. The official citation then describes the morning of the third day of battle. As the pilots of his squadron left the ready room to man their planes, Lieutenant Powers said to them, Remember, the folks back home are counting on us. I am going to get a hit if I have to lay it on their flight deck. He led his section down to the target from an altitude of 18,000 feet, through a wall of bursting anti-aircraft shells and swarms of enemy planes. He dived almost to the very deck of the enemy carrier, and did not release his bomb until he was sure of a direct hit. He was last seen attempting recovery from his dive at the extremely low altitude of 200 feet, amid a terrific barrage of shell and bomb fragments, and smoke and flame and debris from the stricken vessel. His own plane was destroyed by the explosion of his own bomb but he had made good his promise to lay it on their flight deck. I have received a recommendation from the Secretary of the Navy that Lieutenant John James Powers of New York City, missing in action, be awarded the Medal of Honor. I hereby and now make this reward. You and I are the folks back home for whose protection Lieutenant Powers fought and repeatedly risked his life. He said that we counted on him and his men. We did not count in vain. But have not those men a right to be counting on us? How are we playing our part back home in winning this war? The answer is that we are not doing enough. Today, I sent a message to the Congress, pointing out the overwhelming urgency of the serious domestic economic crisis with which we are threatened. Some call it inflation, which is a vague sort of term, and others call it a rise in the cost of living, which is much more easily understood by most families. That phrase, the cost of living, means essentially what a dollar can buy. From January 1, 1941, to May of this year, nearly a year and a half, the cost of living went up about 15%. And at that point last May, we undertook to freeze the cost of living. But we could not do a complete job of it, because the Congressional Authority at the time exempted a large part of farm products used for food and for making clothing, although several weeks before, 
I had asked Congress for legislation to stabilize all farm prices. At that time, I had told the Congress that there were seven elements in our national economy, all of which had to be controlled, and that if any one essential element remained exempt, the cost of living could not be held down. On only two of these points, both of them vital, however, did I call for congressional action. These two vital points were, first, taxation, and second, the stabilization of all farm prices at parity. Parity is a standard for the maintenance of good farm prices. It was established as our national policy way back in 1933. It means that the farmer and the city worker are on the same relative ratio with each other in purchasing power as they were during a period some 30 years before. At a time then, the farmer had a satisfactory purchasing power. 100% of parity, therefore, has been accepted by farmers as the fair standard for the prices they receive. Last January, however, the Congress passed a law forbidding ceilings on farm prices below 110% of parity on some commodities. And, on other commodities, the ceiling was even higher, so that the average possible ceiling is now about 116% of parity for agricultural products as a whole. This act of favoritism for one particular group in the community increased the cost of food to everybody, not only to the workers in the city or in the munitions plants and their families, but also to the families of the farmers themselves. Since last May, ceilings have been set on nearly all commodities, rents, services, except the exempted farm products. Installment buying, for example, has been effectively controlled. Wages in certain key industries have been stabilized on the basis of the present cost of living. But it is obvious to all of us that if the cost of food continues to go up, as it is doing at present, the wage earner, particularly in the lower brackets, will have a right to an increase in his wages. I think that would be essential justice and a practical necessity. Our experience with the control of other prices during the past few months has brought out one important fact. The rising cost of living can be controlled, providing that all elements making up the cost of living are controlled at the same time. I think that also is an essential justice and a practical necessity. We know that parity prices for farm products, not now controlled, will not put up the cost of living more than a very small amount. But we also know that if we must go up to an average of 116% of parity for food and other farm products, which is necessary at present under the Emergency Price Control Act before we can control our old farm prices, the cost of living will get well out of hand. We are face to face with this danger today. Let us meet it and remove it. I realize that it may seem out of proportion to you to be overstressing these economic problems at a time like this, when we are all deeply concerned about the news from far distant fields of battle. But I give you the solemn assurance that failure to solve this problem here at home, and to solve it now, will make more difficult the winning of this war. If the vicious spiral of inflation ever gets under way, the whole economic system will stagger. Prices and wages will go up so rapidly that the entire production program will be endangered. The cost of war, paid by taxpayers, will jump beyond all present calculations. It will mean an uncontrollable rise in prices and in wages, which can result in raising the overall cost of living as high as another 20% soon. That would mean that the purchasing power of every dollar that you have in your pay envelope, or in the bank, or included in your insurance policy or your pension, would be reduced to about 80 cents worth. I need not tell you that this would have a demoralizing effect on our people, soldiers, and civilians alike. Overall stabilization of prices and salaries, wages and profits is necessary to the continued increasing production of planes and tanks and ships and guns. In my message to Congress today, I have said that this must be done quickly. If we wait for two or three or four or six months, it may well be too late. 
I have told the Congress that the administration cannot hold the actual cost of food and clothing down to the present level beyond October 1st. Therefore, I have asked the Congress to pass legislation under which the President would be specifically authorized to stabilize the cost of living, including the price of all farm commodities. The purpose should be to hold farm prices at parity, or at levels of a recent date, whichever is higher. The purpose should also be to keep wages at a point stabilized with today's cost of living. Both must be regulated at the same time, and neither one of them can or should be regulated without the other. At the same time that farm prices are stabilized, I will stabilize wages. That is plain justice and plain common sense. And so I have asked the Congress to take this action by the 1st of October. We must now act with the dispatch which the stern necessities of war require. I have told the Congress that inaction on their part, by that date, will leave me with an inescapable responsibility, a responsibility to the people of this country to see to it that the war effort is no longer imperiled by the threat of economic chaos. As I said in my message to Congress, in the event that the Congress should fail to act and act adequately, I shall accept the responsibility, and I will act. The President has the powers, under the Constitution and under Congressional Acts, to take measures necessary to avert a disaster which would interfere with the winning of the war. I have given the most careful and thoughtful consideration to meeting this issue without further reference to the Congress. I have determined, however, on this vital matter to consult with Congress. There may be those who will say that, if the situation is as grave as I have stated it to be, I should use my powers and act now. I can only say that I have approached this problem from every angle and that I have decided that the course of conduct which I am following in this case is consistent with my sense of responsibility as President in time of war, and with my deep and unalterable devotion to the processes of democracy. The responsibilities of the President in wartime to protect the nation are very grave. This total war, with our fighting fronts all over the world, makes the use of the executive power far more essential than in any previous war. If we were invaded, the people of this country would expect the President to use any and all means to repel the invader. Now the revolution and the war between the states were fought on our own soil, but today this war will be won or lost on other continents and in remote seas. I cannot tell what powers may have to be exercised in order to win this war. The American people can be sure that I will use my powers with a full sense of responsibility to the Constitution and to my country. The American people can also be sure that I shall not hesitate to use every power vested in me to accomplish the defeat of our enemies in any part of the world where our own safety demands such defeat. And when the war is over, the powers under which I act will automatically revert to the people of the United States, to the people to whom those powers belong. I think I know the American farmers. I know they are as wholehearted in their patriotism as any other group. They have suffered from the constant fluctuations of farm prices, occasionally too high, more often too low. Nobody knows better than farmers the disastrous effects of wartime inflationary booms and post-war deflationary panics. So I have also suggested today that the Congress make our agricultural economy more stable. I have recommended that in addition to putting ceilings on all farm products now, we also place a definite floor under those prices for a period beginning now, continuing through the war, and for as long as necessary after the war. In this way, we will be able to avoid the collapse of farm prices that happened after the last war. The farmers must be assured of a fair minimum price during the readjustment period which will follow the great, excessive world food demands which now prevail. We must have some floor under farm prices, as we must have under wages, if we are to avoid the dangers of a post-war inflation on the one hand, 
or the catastrophe of a crash in farm prices and wages on the other. Today, I have also advised the Congress of the importance of speeding up the passage of the tax bill. The Federal Treasury is losing millions of dollars each and every day because the bill has not yet been passed. Taxation is the only practical way of preventing the incomes and profits of individuals and corporations from getting too high. I have told the Congress once more that all net individual incomes, after payment of all taxes, should be limited effectively by further taxation to a maximum net income of $25,000 a year. And it is equally important that corporate profits should not exceed a reasonable amount in any case. The nation must have more money to run the war. People must stop spending for luxuries. Our country needs a far greater share of our incomes. For this is a global war, and it will cost this nation nearly $100 billion in 1943. In that global war, there are now four main areas of combat, and I should like to speak briefly of them, not in the order of their importance, for all of them are vital, and all of them are interrelated. Number one, the Russian front. Here, the Germans are still unable to gain the smashing victory which, almost a year ago, Hitler announced he had already achieved. Germany has been able to capture important Russian territory. Nevertheless, Hitler has been unable to destroy a single Russian army, and this, you may be sure, has been, and still is, his main objective. Millions of German troops seem doomed to spend another cruel and bitter winter on the Russian front. Yes, the Russians are killing more Nazis and destroying more airplanes and tanks than are being smashed on any other front. They are fighting not only bravely, but brilliantly. In spite of any setbacks, Russia will hold out and with the help of her allies will ultimately drive every Nazi from her soil. Number two. The Pacific Ocean Area. This area must be grouped together as a whole, every part of it, land and sea. We have stopped one major Japanese offensive, and we have inflicted heavy losses on their fleet. But they still possess great strength. They seek to keep the initiative, and they will undoubtedly strike hard again. We must not overrate the importance of our successes in the Solomon Islands though we may be proud of the skill with which these local operations were conducted. At the same time, we need not underrate the significance of our victory at Midway. There we stopped the major Japanese offensive. Number three. In the Mediterranean and the Middle East area, the British, together with the South Africans, Australians, New Zealanders, Indian troops, and others of the United Nations, including ourselves, are fighting a desperate battle with the Germans and Italians. The Axis powers are fighting to gain control of that area, dominate the Mediterranean and the Indian Ocean, and gained contact with the Japanese Navy. The battle in the Middle East is now joined. We are well aware of our danger, but we are hopeful of the outcome. Number 4. The European Area Here the aim is an offensive against Germany. There are at least a dozen different points at which attacks can be launched. You, of course, do not expect me to give details of future plans, but you can rest assured that preparations are being made here and in Britain towards this purpose. The power of Germany must be broken on the battlefields of Europe. Various people urge that we should concentrate our forces on one or another of these four areas, although no one suggests that any one of the four areas should be abandoned. Certainly, it could not be seriously urged that we abandon aid to Russia, or that we surrender all of the Pacific to Japan, or the Mediterranean and Middle East to Germany, or give up an offensive against Germany. The American people may be sure that we shall neglect none of the four great theaters of war. Certain vital military decisions have been made. In due time you will know what these decisions are, and so will our enemies. I can say now that all of these decisions are directed towards taking the offensive. Today, 
exactly nine months after Pearl Harbor, we have sent overseas three times more men than we transported to France in the first nine months of the First World War. We have done this in spite of greater danger and fewer ships. And every week sees a gain in the actual number of American men and weapons in the fighting areas. These reinforcements in men and munitions are continuing, and will continue to go forward. This war will finally be won by the coordination of all the armies, navies, and air forces in all of the United Nations operating in unison against our enemies. This will require vast assemblies of weapons and men at all the vital points of attack. We and our allies have worked for years to achieve superiority in weapons. We have no doubts about the superiority of our men. We glory in the individual exploits of our soldiers, our sailors, our marines, our merchant seamen. Lieutenant John James Powers was one of these, and there are thousands of others in the forces of the United Nations. Several thousand Americans have met death in battle. Other thousands will lose their lives. But many millions stand ready to step into their places, to engage in a struggle to the very death. For they know that the enemy is determined to destroy us, our homes, and our institutions, that in this war it is kill or be killed. Battles are not won by soldiers or sailors who think first of their own personal safety. And wars are not won by people who are concerned primarily with their own comfort, their own convenience, their own pocketbooks. We Americans of today bear the gravest of responsibilities, and all of the United Nations share them. All of us here at home are being tested for our fortitude, for our selfless devotion to our country and to our cause. This is the toughest war of all time. We need not leave it to historians of the future to answer the question whether we are tough enough to meet this unprecedented challenge. We can give that answer now. The answer is yes. End section 24. Section 25 of the Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin D. Roosevelt. October 12, 1942. My fellow Americans, as you know, I have recently come back from a trip of inspection of camps and training stations and war factories. The main thing that I observed on this trip is not exactly news. It is the plain fact that the American people are united as ever before in their determination to do a job and to do it well. This whole nation of 130 million free men, women, and children is becoming one great fighting force. Some of us are soldiers or sailors. Some of us are civilians. Some of us are fighting the war in airplanes five miles above the continent of Europe or the islands of the Pacific. And some of us are fighting it in mines deep down in the earth in Pennsylvania or Montana. A few of us are decorated with medals for heroic achievement but all of us can have that deep and permanent inner satisfaction that comes from doing the best we know how, each of us playing an honorable part in the great struggle to save our democratic civilization. Whatever our individual circumstances or opportunities, we are all in it, and our spirit is good, and we Americans and our allies are going to win, and do not let anyone tell you anything different. That is the main thing that I saw on my trip around the country, unbeatable spirit. If the leaders of Germany and Japan could have come along with me and had seen what I saw, they would agree with my conclusions. Unfortunately, they were unable to make the trip with me. And that is one reason why we are carrying our war effort overseas, to them. 
With every passing week, the war increases in scope and intensity. That is true in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, and on all the seas. The strength of the United Nations is on the upgrade in this war. The Axis leaders, on the other hand, know by now that they have already reached their full strength, and that their steadily mounting losses in men and material cannot be fully replaced. Germany and Japan are already realizing what the inevitable result will be when the total strength of the United Nations hits them, at additional places on the Earth's surface. One of the principal weapons of our enemies in the past has been their use of what is called the War of Nerves. They have spread falsehood and terror. They have started fifth columns everywhere. They have duped the innocent. They have fomented suspicion and hate between neighbors. They have aided and abetted those people in other nations, including our own, whose words and deeds are advertised from Berlin and from Tokyo as proof of our disunity. The greatest defense against all such propaganda, of course, is the common sense of the common people, and that defense is prevailing. The war of nerves against the United Nations is now turning into a boomerang. For the first time, the Nazi propaganda machine is on the defensive. They began to apologize to their own people for the repulse of their vast forces at Stalingrad, and for the enormous casualties they are suffering. They are compelled to beg their overworked people to rally their weakened production. They even publicly admit, for the first time, that Germany can be fed only at the cost of stealing food from the rest of Europe. They are proclaiming that a second front is impossible, but, at the same time, they are desperately rushing troops in all directions, and stringing barbed wire all the way from the coasts of Finland and Norway to the islands of the eastern Mediterranean. Meanwhile, they are driven to increase the fury of their atrocities. The United Nations have decided to establish the identity of those Nazi leaders who are responsible for the innumerable acts of savagery. As each of these criminal deeds is committed, it is being carefully investigated, and the evidence is being relentlessly piled up for future purposes of justice. We have made it entirely clear that the United Nations seek no mass reprisals against the populations of Germany or Italy or Japan. But the ring leaders and their brutal henchmen must be named and apprehended and tried in accordance with the judicial processes of criminal law. There are now millions of Americans in army camps, in naval stations, in factories and in shipyards. Who are these millions upon whom the life of our country depends? What are they thinking? What are their doubts? What are their hopes? And how is the work progressing? The Commander-in-Chief cannot learn all of the answers to these questions in Washington, and that is why I made the trip I did. It is very easy to say, as some have said, that when the President travels through the country, he should go with a blare of trumpets, with crowds on the sidewalks, with batteries of reporters and photographers, talking and posing with all of the politicians of the land. But having had some experience in this war, and in the last war, I can tell you very simply that the kind of trip I took permitted me to concentrate on the work I had to do without expending time meeting all the demands of publicity. And, I might add, it was a particular pleasure to make a tour of the country without having to give a single thought to politics. I expect to make other trips for similar purposes, and I shall make them in the same way. In the last war, I had seen great factories, but until I saw some of the new present-day plants, I had not thoroughly visualized our American war effort. Of course, I saw only a small portion of all our plants, but that portion was a good cross-section, and it was deeply impressive. The United States has been at war for only 10 months, and is engaged in the enormous tax of multiplying its armed forces many times. We are by no means at full production level yet. But I could not help asking myself on the trip, where would we be today if the government of the United States had not begun to build many of its factories for this huge increase more than two years ago, 
more than a year before war was forced upon us at Pearl Harbor. We have also had to face the problem of shipping. Ships in every part of the world continue to be sunk by enemy action. But the total tonnage of ships coming out of American, Canadian, and British shipyards day by day has increased so fast that we are getting ahead of our enemies in the bitter battle of transportation. In expanding our shipping, we have had to enlist many thousands of men for our merchant marine. These men are serving magnificently. They are risking their lives every hour so that guns and tanks and planes and ammunition and food may be carried to the heroic defenders of Stalingrad and to all the United Nations forces all over the world. A few days ago, I awarded the first Maritime Distinguished Service Medal to a young man, Edward F. Cheney of Yeadon, Pennsylvania, who had shown great gallantry in rescuing his comrades from the oily waters of the sea after their ship had been torpedoed. There will be many more such acts of bravery. In one sense, my recent trip was a hurried one, out through the Middle West, to the Northwest, down the length of the Pacific Coast, and back through the Southwest and the South. In another sense, however, it was a leisurely trip, because I had the opportunity to talk to the people who are actually doing the work, management and labor alike, on their own home grounds. And it gave me a fine chance to do some thinking about the major problems of our war effort on the basis of first things first. As I told the three press association representatives who accompanied me, I was impressed by the large proportion of women employed, doing skilled manual labor running machines. As time goes on, and many more of our men enter the armed forces, this proportion of women will increase. Within less than a year from now, I think, there will be probably as many women as men working in our war production plants. I had some enlightening experiences relating to the old saying of us men that curiosity, inquisitiveness, is stronger among women. I noticed frequently that when we drove unannounced down the middle aisle of a great plant full of workers and machines, the first people to look up from their work were the men, and not the women. It was chiefly the men who were arguing as to whether that fellow in the straw hat was really the president or not. So having seen the quality of the work and of the workers on our production lines, and coupling these first-hand observations with the purports of actual performance of our weapons on the fighting fronts, I can say to you that we are getting ahead of our enemies in the battle of production. And of great importance to our future production, was the effective and rapid manner in which the Congress met the serious problem of the rising cost of living. It was a splendid example of the operation of democratic process in wartime. The machinery to carry out this act of the Congress was put into effect within 12 hours after the bill was signed. The legislation will help the cost of living problems of every worker in every factory and on every farm in the land. In order to keep stepping up our production, we have had to add millions of workers to the total labor force of the nation. And as new factories came into operation, we must find additional millions of workers. This presents a formidable problem in the mobilization of manpower. It is not that we do not have enough people in this country to do the job. The problem is to have the right numbers of the right people in the right places at the right time. We are learning to ration materials, and we must now learn to ration manpower. The major objectives of a sound manpower policy are First, to select and train men of the highest fighting efficiency needed for our armed forces in the achievement of victory over our enemies in combat. Second, to man our war industries and farms with the workers needed to produce the arms and munitions and food required by ourselves and by our fighting allies to win this war. In order to do this, we shall be compelled to stop workers from moving from one war job to another as a matter of personal preference, to stop employers from stealing labor from each other, to use older men and handicapped people, and more women and even grown boys and girls, wherever possible and reasonable, to replace men of military age and fitness, to train new personnel for essential war work, 
and to stop the wastage of labor in all non-essential activities. There are many other things that we can do, and do immediately, to help meet this manpower problem. The school authorities in all the states should work out plans to enable our high school students to take some time from their school year and to use their summer vacations to help farmers raise and harvest their crops or to work somewhere in the war industries. This does not mean closing schools and stopping education. It does mean giving older students a better opportunity to contribute their bit to the war effort. Such work will do no harm to the students. People should do their work as near their homes as possible. We cannot afford to transport a single worker into an area where there is already a worker available to do the job. In some communities, employers dislike to employ women. In others, they are reluctant to hire Negroes. In still others, older men are not wanted. We can no longer afford to indulge such prejudices or practices. Every citizen wants to know what essential war work he can do the best. He can get the answer by applying to the nearest United States Employment Services office. There are 4,500 of these offices throughout the nation. They form the corner grocery stores of our manpower system. This network of employment offices is prepared to advise every citizen where his skills and labors are needed most and to refer him to an employer who can utilize them to the best advantage in the war effort. Perhaps the most difficult phase of the manpower problem is the scarcity of farm labor in many places. I have seen evidences of the fact, however, that the people are trying to meet it as well as possible. In one community that I visited, a perishable crop was harvested by turning out the whole of the high school for three or four days. And in another community of fruit growers, the usual Japanese labor was not available, but when the fruit ripened, the banker, the butcher, the lawyer, the garage man, the druggist, the local editor, and in fact every able-bodied man and woman in the town left their occupations and went out, gathered the fruit, and sent it to market. Every farmer in the land must realize fully that his production is part of war production and that he is regarded by the nation as essential to victory. The American people expect him to keep his production up, and even to increase it. We will use every effort to help him get labor, but, at the same time, he and the people of his community must use ingenuity and cooperative effort to produce crops and livestock and dairy products. It may be that all of our volunteer effort, however well-intentioned and well-administered, will not suffice wholly to solve this problem. In that case, we shall have to adopt new legislation. And if this is necessary, I do not believe that the American people will shrink from it. In a sense, every American, because of the privilege of his citizenship, is a part of the selective service. The nation owes a debt of gratitude to the selective service boards. The successful operation of the selective service system and the way it has been accepted by the great mass of our citizens gives us confidence that if necessary, the same principle could be used to solve any manpower problem. And I want to say also a word of praise and thanks to the more than 10 million people all over the country who have volunteered for the work of civilian defense and who are working hard at it. They are displaying unselfish devotion in the patient performance of their often tiresome and always anonymous tasks. In doing this important neighborly work, they are helping to fortify our national unity and our real understanding of the fact that we are all involved in this war. Naturally, on my trip, I was most interested in watching the training of our fighting forces. All of our combat units that go overseas must consist of young, strong men who have had thorough training. An army division that has an average age of 23 or 24 is a better fighting unit than one which has an average age of 33 or 34. The more of such troops we have in the field, the sooner the war will be won, and the smaller will be the cost and casualties. 
Therefore, I believe that it will be necessary to lower the present minimum age limit for selective service from 20 years down to 18. We have learned how inevitable that is, and how important to the speeding up of victory. I can very thoroughly understand the feelings of all parents whose sons have entered our armed forces. I have an appreciation of that feeling, and so has my wife. I want every father and every mother who has a son in the service to know, again from what I have seen with my own eyes, that the men in the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps are receiving today the best possible training, equipment, and medical care. And we will never fail to provide for the spiritual needs of our officers and men under the chaplains of our armed services. Good training will save many, many lives in battle. The highest rate of casualties is always suffered by units comprised of inadequately trained men. We can be sure that the combat units of our Army and Navy are well manned, well equipped, and well trained. Their effectiveness in action will depend upon the quality of their leadership and upon the wisdom of the strategic plans on which all military operations are based. I can say one thing about these plans of ours. They are not being decided by the typewriter strategists who expound their views on the radio or in the press. One of the greatest of American soldiers, Robert E. Lee, once remarked on the tragic fact that in the war of his day all of the best generals were apparently working on newspapers instead of in the army. And that seems to be true in all wars. The trouble with the typewriter strategists is that while they may be full of bright ideas, they are not in possession of much information about the facts or problems of military operations. We, therefore, will continue to leave the plans for this war to the military leaders. The military and naval plans of the United States are made by the joint staff of the Army and Navy, which is constantly in session in Washington. The chiefs of this staff are Admiral Leahy, General Marshall, Admiral King, and General Arnold. They meet and confer regularly with representatives of the British Joint Staff and with representatives of Russia, China, the Netherlands, Poland, Norway, the British Dominion, and other nations working in the common cause. Since this unity of operations was put into effect last January, there has been a very substantial agreement between these planners, all of whom are trained in the profession of arms, air, sea, and land, from their early years. As Commander-in-Chief, I have at all times also been in substantial agreement. As I have said before, many major decisions of strategy have been made. One of them, on which we have all agreed, relates to the necessity of diverting enemy forces from Russia and China to other theaters of war by new offensives against Germany and Japan. An announcement of how these offensives are to be launched and when and where cannot be broadcast over the radio at this time. We are celebrating today the exploit of a bold and adventurous Italian, Christopher Columbus, who with the aid of Spain opened up a new world where freedom and tolerance and respect for human rights and dignity provided an asylum for the oppressed of the old world. Today, the sons of the new world are fighting in lands far distant from their own America. They are fighting to save for all mankind, including ourselves, the principles which have flourished in this new world of freedom. We are mindful of the countless millions of people whose future liberty and whose very lives depend upon permanent victory for the United Nations. There are a few people in this country who, when the collapse of the Axis begins, will tell our people that we are safe once more, that we can tell the rest of the world to, quote, stew in its own juice, unquote that never again will we help pull, quote, the other fellow's chestnuts from the fire, unquote, that the future of civilization can jolly well take care of itself insofar as we are concerned. But it is useless to win battles if the cause for which we fight these battles is lost. It is useless to win a war unless it stays won. We, therefore, fight for the restoration and perpetuation of faith and hope and peace throughout the world. The objective of today is clear and realistic. It is to destroy completely the military power of Germany, Italy, and Japan, 
to such good purpose that their threat against us and all the other united nations cannot be revived a generation hence. We are united in seeking the kind of victory that will guarantee that our grandchildren can grow and, under God, may live their lives free from the constant threat of invasion, destruction, slavery, and violent death. End section 25. Section 26 of The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin D. Roosevelt. May 2nd, 1943. My fellow Americans, I am speaking tonight to the American people, and in particular to those of our citizens who are coal miners. Tonight this country faces a serious crisis. We are engaged in a war on the successful outcome of which will depend the whole future of our country. This war has reached a new critical phase. After the years that we have spent in preparation, we have moved into active and continuing battle with our enemies. We are pouring into the worldwide conflict everything that we have, our young men, and the vast resources of our nation. I have just returned from a two weeks tour of inspection on which I saw our men being trained and our war materials made. My trip took me through twenty states. I saw thousands of workers on the production line making airplanes and guns and ammunition. Everywhere I found great eagerness to get on with the war men and women are working long hours at difficult jobs and living under difficult conditions without complaint along thousands of miles of track i saw countless acres of newly ploughed fields the farmers of this country are planting the crops that are needed to feed our armed forces our civilian population and our allies those crops will be harvested on my trip i saw hundreds of thousands of soldiers young men who were green recruits last autumn have matured into self-assured and hardened fighting men they are in splendid physical condition they are mastering the superior weapons that we are pouring out of our factories the american people have accomplished a miracle however all of our massed effort is none too great to meet the demands of this war we shall need everything that we have and everything that our allies have to defeat the nazis and the fascists in the coming battles on the continent of europe and the japanese on the continent of asia and in the islands of the pacific this tremendous forward movement of the united states and the united nations cannot be stopped by our enemies and equally it must not be hampered by any one individual or by the leaders of any one group here back home i wanted to make it clear that every american coal miner who has stopped mining coal no matter how sincere his motives no matter how legitimate he may believe his grievances to be every idle miner directly and individually is obstructing our war effort we have not yet won this war we will win this war only as we produce and deliver our total american effort on the high seas and on the battle fronts and that requires unrelenting uninterrupted effort here on the home front a stopping of the coal supply even for a short time would involve a gamble with the lives of american soldiers and sailors and the future security of our whole people it would involve an unwarranted unnecessary and terribly dangerous gamble with our chances for victory therefore i say to all miners and to all americans everywhere at home and abroad the production of coal will not be stopped tonight i am speaking to the essential patriotism of the miners and to the patriotism of their wives and children and i am going to state the true facts of this case as simply and as plainly as i know how after the attack at pearl harbor the three great labor organizations the american federation of labor the congress of industrial organizations and the railroad brotherhoods gave the positive assurance that there would be no strikes as long as the war lasted and the president of the united mine workers of america was a party to that assurance that pledge was applauded throughout the country it was a forcible means of telling the world that we americans 
one hundred thirty five million of us are united in our determination to fight this total war with our total will and our total power at the request of employers and of organized labor including the united mine workers the war labor board was set up for settling any disputes which could not be adjusted through collective bargaining the war labor board is a tribunal on which workers employers and the general public are equally represented in the present coal crisis conciliation and mediation were tried unsuccessfully in accordance with the law the case was then certified to the war labor board the agency created for this express purpose with the approval of organized labor the members of the board followed the usual practice which has proved successful in other disputes acting promptly they undertook to get all the facts of the case from both the miners and the operators the national officers of the united mine workers however declined to have anything to do with the fact-finding of the war labor board the only excuse that they offer is that the war labor board is prejudiced the war labor board has been and is ready to give this case a fair and impartial hearing and i have given my assurance that if any adjustment of wages is made by the board it will be made retroactive to april first but the national officers of the united mine workers refused to participate in the hearing when asked to do so last monday on wednesday of this past week while the board was proceeding with the case stoppages began to occur in some mines on thursday morning i telegraphed to the officers of the united mine workers asking that the miners continue mining coal on saturday morning however a general strike throughout the industry became effective on friday night the responsibility for the crisis that we now face rests squarely on these national officers of the united mine workers and not on the government of the united states but the consequences of this arbitrary action threaten all of us everywhere at ten o'clock yesterday morning the government took over the mines i called upon the miners to return to work for their government the government needs their services just as surely as it needs the services of our soldiers and sailors and marines and the services of the millions who are turning out the munitions of war you miners have sons in the army and navy and marine corps you have sons who at this very minute this split second may be fighting in new guinea or in the aleutian islands or guadalcanal or tunisia or china or protecting troop ships and supplies against submarines on the high seas we have already received telegrams from some of our fighting men overseas and i only wish they could tell you what they think of the stoppage of work in the coal mines some of your own sons have come back from the fighting fronts wounded a number of them for example are now here in an army hospital in washington several of them have been decorated by their government i could tell you of one from pennsylvania he was a coal miner before his induction and his father is a coal miner he was seriously wounded by nazi machine-gun bullets while he was on a bombing mission over europe in a flying fortress another boy from kentucky the son of a coal miner was wounded when our troops first landed in north africa six months ago there is still another from illinois he was a coal miner his father and two brothers are coal miners he was seriously wounded in tunisia while attempting to rescue two comrades whose jeep had been blown up by a nazi mine these men do not consider themselves heroes they would probably be embarrassed if i mentioned their names over the air they were wounded in the line of duty they know how essential it is to the tens of thousands hundreds of thousands and ultimately millions of other young americans to get the best of arms and equipment into the hands of our fighting forces and get them there quickly the fathers and mothers of our fighting men their brothers and sisters and friends and that includes all of us are also in the line of duty the production line any failure in production may well result in costly defeat on the field of battle there can be no one among us no one faction powerful enough to interrupt the forward march of our people to victory you miners have ample reason to know that there are certain basic rights for which this country stands and that those rights are worth fighting for and worth dying for that is why you have sent your sons and brothers from every mining town in the nation to join in the great struggle overseas that is why you have contributed so generously so willingly 
to the purchase of war bonds and to the many funds for the relief of war victims in foreign lands that is why since this war was started in nineteen thirty nine you have increased the annual production of coal by almost two hundred million tons a year the toughness of your sons and our armed forces is not surprising they come of fine rugged stock men who work in the mines are not unaccustomed to hardship it has been the objective of this government to reduce that hardship to obtain for miners and for all who do the nation's work a better standard of living i know only too well that the cost of living is troubling the miners families and troubling the families of millions of other workers throughout the country as well a year ago it became evident to all of us that something had to be done about living costs your government determined not to let the cost of living continue to go up as it did in the first world war your government has been determined to maintain stability in both prices and wages so that a dollar would buy so far as possible the same amount of the necessities of life and by necessities i mean just that not the luxuries not the fancy goods that we have learned to do without in a war time so far we have not been able to keep the prices of some necessities as low as we should have liked to keep them that is true not only in coal towns but in many other places wherever we find that prices of essentials have risen too high they will be brought down wherever we find that price ceilings are being violated the violators will be punished rents have been fixed in most parts of the country in many cities they have been cut to below where they were before we entered the war clothing prices have generally remained stable these two items make up more than a third of the total budget of the workers family as for food which today accounts for about another third of the family expenditure on the average i want to repeat again your government will continue to take all necessary measures to eliminate unjustified and avoidable price increases and we are today taking measures to roll back the prices of meats the war is going to go on coal will be mine no matter what any individual thinks about it the operation of our factories our power plants our railroads will not be stopped our munitions must move to our troops and so under these circumstances it is inconceivable that any patriotic miner can choose any course other than going back to work and mining coal the nation cannot afford violence of any kind at the coal mines or in coal towns i have placed authority for the resumption of coal mining in the hands of a civilian the secretary of the interior if it becomes necessary to protect any miner who seeks patriotically to go back and work then that miner must have and his family must have and will have complete and adequate protection if it becomes necessary to have troops at the mine mouths or in coal towns for the protection of working miners and their families those troops will be doing police duty for the sake of the nation as a whole and particularly for the sake of the fighting men in the army the navy and the marines your sons and mine who are fighting our common enemies all over the world i understand the devotion of the coal miners to their union i know of the sacrifices they have made to build it up i believe now as i have all my life in the right of workers to join unions and to protect their unions i want to make it absolutely clear that this government is not going to do anything now to weaken those rights in the coal fields every improvement in the conditions of the coal miners of this country has had my hearty support and i do not mean to desert them now but i also do not mean to desert my obligations and responsibilities as president of the united states and commander-in-chief of the army and navy the first necessity is the resumption of coal mining the terms of the old contract will be followed by the secretary of the interior if an adjustment in wages results from a decision of the war labor board or from any new agreement between the operators and miners which is approved by the war labor board that adjustment will be made retroactive to april first in the message that i delivered to the congress four months ago i expressed my conviction that the spirit of this nation is good since then i have seen our troops in the caribbean area in bases on the coasts of our ally brazil and in north africa recently i have again seen great numbers of our fellow countrymen soldiers and civilians from the atlantic seaboard to the mexican border and to the rocky mountains tonight in the fact of a crisis 
of serious proportions in the coal industry i say again that the spirit or this nation is good i know that the american people will not tolerate any threat offered to their government by any one i believe the coal miners will not continue the strike against their government i believe that the coal miners as americans will not fail to heed the clear call to duty like all other good americans they will march shoulder to shoulder with their armed forces to victory to-morrow the stars and stripes will fly over the coal mines and i hope that every miner will be at work under that flag end of section twenty six